now move to questions to the Minister of Education and we first start with topical questions. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, could he give a formal update on the future of the Immaculate Conception College in Derry? Um, I understand that CCMAS are proposing to publish a development proposal which would see the closure of the Immaculate Conception uh, in Derry, but to date no such proposal has been published. If one, such a proposal is published, it will be, go out to a two-month consultation period, during which time uh, members of the House, members of the public and interested parties will be able to um, enter a consultation period with myself and put across their views in relation to that matter. Pat Ramsey. I, I thank the, the Minister f for, for his response, but would he understand the absolute worry, concern and anger within the parents of pupils attending the school amongst the staff? that this particular only Catholic post-primary school on the water side has been starved of funding and any form of modernisation for decades now. And will the Minister reflecting that in terms of going forward, that their opinions are so important, and to make sure that there is the most effective consultation with everyone in the community leaders in that area? I am legally obliged to carry out an effective consultation with everyone in that area. Uh, and the reason why I brought earlier planning into place is that we do not see scenarios where the term which has been used to me before that schools are allowed to die on the vine. But we want to see schools in a planned school as a state moving forward, providing excellent education to our young people moving into the future. So I'm, I'm not in a position to talk about what happened in the past, but I, I will be in a position of what will happen in the future. And whatever the decision I come to, if I am involved in a decision making process and if a development proposal is published, will be about ensuring that all of the young people in that area have access to high-quality uh, educational services. Question number two, Mr Hussey, is not in his place. Adrian McQuillan. Mr McQuillan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In light of the publication today of Learning to Learn, does this mean the Minister has given up hope on an early year strategy? No. The very fact that I published a Learning to Learn strategy this morning proves that I have, we have, now have the Department of Education as an early uh, year's strategy. The early year strategy previously published um, was published in a time which was seen a greater role for health in, in relation to early years and other departments in early years, and the strategy ran into difficulties. We recognised those difficulties, we responded to the consultation responses within that, and I acknowledge the fact that the Department of Education had a key role in its strategy and it needed to put its policies on paper. Learning to Learn does that. It sets out quite clearly how we are going to invest in our preschool education services, how we are going to move forward towards the future. It also acknowledges that through the executives delivering social change programme that there is an ideal opportunity there for all the departments to cooperate together and to deliver a, an early year strategy for our entire society. So I haven't given up on any of those things. We have put a firm commitment down today in our Learning to Learn strategy and we will continue to develop close working links with all the other uh, relevant government departments through the developing social change agenda. Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answer? What are the implications, Minister, on today's announcement for the funding for such as preschools like Harpers Hill and my own constituency of Corian? Well, I congratulate the member on getting his constituency mentioned in the question. It will have no uh, negative financial implications for any preschool setting. Uh, it sets out a programme of policies in terms of curriculum activities should, that should be taking place in our preschools, activities, etc., etc. There is no negative funding implications within the Learning to Learn programme. John Dallet. Mr. Dallet. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the Minister for Education would agree with me that one of the most deprived sections of our community in terms of literacy and numeracy are those young people who find themselves uh, behind bars. Given the Criminal Justice Inspections Report of last week, what can the Minister for Education do? perhaps in conjunction with the Minister for Justice, to ensure that these young people are not failed for the second time in their lives? Um, I am aware of this issue, uh, both from being a previous member of the Justice Committee and, indeed, as my role of Education Minister. Uh, the unfortunate truth of the matter is that many of our young people, indeed older people who find themselves in jail, also have a very poor educational record and attainment level. Uh, and that is one of the things I have centred in my policies to correct. In relation to how we move forward with education within our jails of state, that currently is a matter for the Justice Minister. However, I have met with the Justice Minister to discuss a proposal to move um, 
schooling uh, for our youngest people in, in prisons over to the Department of Education. Those discussions are continuing with my officials. Mr. Speaker, I thank the, the Minister uh, for his answer. The Minister, of course, will be aware that there are excellent uh, examples of good educational practice in McGilligan Prison. What can he as Minister do to ensure that those particular uh, schemes are rolled out in the other prisons, and particularly in Hyde Bank and in the Young Offender Centre, which seems to be a, a centre where it is badly needed but not delivered? Uh, again, I have no responsibility currently in this field. Um, McGilligan Prison is an adult prison, and even if those, those individuals were on the outside of prison, I would have no responsibility for their education uh, beyond the formal age, of, beyond 16, or if they were to stay on to do A levels, etc. I am aware of, I think it was the Public Accounts Committee published a report into relation to numeracy and literacy, and they used the example of McGilligan. Now, McGilligan appears to be doing good work uh, with, with its inmates, but it's a totally different scenario from a classroom setting, or wherever it may be. But again, I would advise the member to raise those matters with the Justice Minister. Question number five, Mr. Sammy Wilson, not in his place. Dominic Bradley, Mr. Bradley. I am sure the, the Minister would agree with me that providing high quality uh, developmental opportunities throughout a teacher's career is a key element in raising standards. Uh, in, in our schools here. Can I ask the Minister what lessons he brought back from his recent visit uh, to Canada and the United States in this respect? Um, I, the member uh, will be aware that I was in uh, Toronto and New York last week looking at their education systems. And I found the trip very useful from a number of points of view. One, they are facing similar challenges that we are, perhaps on a larger scale in some areas. Uh, in relation to social deprivation, etc., but they're certainly facing similar challenges to what we are. And particularly in Toronto, they have put in place measures which are similar to our own uh, in relation to raising educational attainment for their young people. And one of the areas they have identified is continuous professional development for, for their teaching staff. Now, we have we received um, significant amounts of information on our visit, and we will analyse those further. But one of the areas where I have to say I did find informative uh, in, in meetings with one of, the, one of the trade union movements was this, that the Toronto government has given the trade union movement a significant amount of money to carry out continuous teacher development. And that's one area I'm going to examine as well. Dominic Brown. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, but considering the recent and the proposed cuts to teacher development, how does the Minister propose to deliver real improvement through continuous professional development? Uh, all areas of our education system have seen cuts to their funding as a direct result of British Government uh, cuts to the Black Grant. Education faced its pressures under that as well, as did continuous professional development. And we have to then work within the resources we have. I believe that the current resources we have still allow us to continue to uh, a programme of continuous professional development for our teachers moving forward. Now, I don't stand here and, and argue that the current measures we have in place are the best. We have to continuously improve even our own measures for teacher development, and we will continue to do that, but we will have to do it within the resources we have. Sammy Douglas. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister, in relation to, uh, added, as at a meeting this morning, all party group on visually impaired and people who are blind, um, what his department will, uh, is actually doing and, and uh, support people like that? Um, each child with a visual impairment has unique needs, and teachers of children with visual impairment will provide tailored advice to meet pupils' individual learning needs so that the curriculum can be fully assessed. Where a, part of, where a child with visual impairment Empowerment prevents the child from fully accessing the curriculum. ELBs will address this through the statutory assessment period. Oh, so, sorry, process. Um, thank you, Minister, for his uh, uh, answers uh, thus far. Um, could I ask the Minister, in terms of the, the league table, certainly his own consistency is one of has, um, and is there some way that he could? carry out some sort of investigation, maybe with some other departments, to find out why is it North Belfast is at the top of the league and also your own constituency as well? Um, the member will appreciate I do not have the details of that information in front of me now. Um, 
I suspect poverty levels may also have play a role uh, within this matter, but the Department does have a very good working relationship with the Royal National Institute for the Blind. ETA carried out an inspection report of the services uh, in 2011, and, and the report came back that the ELB has provided a very good standard of visual impairment support. But in, in regards to the matter raises, the, the, the matter the member raises me in relation to the constituencies, I will certainly investigate that matter further. Question number eight has been withdrawn. Declan McAleer. Mr. McAleer. Mr. McAleer is also not in his place. Alec Eason. Could I ask the Education Minister, what is the education system doing to help look, uh, helping to, to, to uh, help looked after children? Um, over this last number of years, and, and even in terms of my predecessor, Katrina Rian, we have introduced funding formulas to our uh, schooling system, which identifies looked after children, ensures that there's additional financial support offered to those children through the funding formula, and in terms of services being delivered to schools by the child psychologists or counselling services as well, we're also conscious of the additional needs of looked after children. So we are aware of the additional burdens uh, placed on our uh, looked after children because of the cir circumstances which are not of their doing and which are beyond their control in relation to the barriers that places for their education. And I can assure the member that support is offered uh, to our looked after children in our education system. Do not all looked after children have personal education plans? And if not, why not, considering that they were meant to be implemented by June 2013? All looked after children may not require uh, a personal uh, education plan. It is down to the school and the education boards to assess such matters. So uh, you cannot just simply say that all looked after children will require uh, a personal education plan. Let the assessments carry out. Let them assess what is required in relation to each individual child. Questions to the Minister. We now move on to all questions to the Minister of Education and I call Mervyn Storey. Mr Storey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And before I call question number one, can I apologise to the House for being absent last Tuesday at questions for DRD. Question number one. I knew you wouldn't miss me. But. Uh, the role of the Area Planning Steering Group is to support my department in taking forward work to coordinate and oversee the continuing development of the area planning process and the area plans. Uh, its role is to embed further the, the area planning process and to address the gaps in the current area plans, to embed a single approach to area planning and to identify priority areas for action in the short to medium term. I have considered the request from a number of bodies seeking to gain membership of the area planning steering group, including the controlled sacral working group. Excuse me. While I am continuing to consider the matter, the, the current controlled sacral support body has no legislative basis. Uh, the Control Sacral Support Working Group is part of the ESA Bill, which requires to complete its legislative journey before the Control Sacral Support Body will have any legal identity. It is clear and unequivocal commitment by both myself. Sorry, there is a clear and unequivocal commitment by both myself and the executive to establish a sacral support body for the controlled schools. That was a commitment clearly reflected in both the heads of agreement published by the First and Deputy First Minister last November and in papers I have tabled at the executive. I have acted on this by setting up a working group that is representative of the controlled sector, which I have tasked with the establishment of a body that will represent and advocate for controlled schools. My department has funded the activities of this working group from October 2012 and is funding in place to support work through until December 2013. Uh, I have also acted on the commitment in the legislation that I have brought to the Assembly. The provision in the Education Bill are designed to deliver party of representation for all sectoral support groups. Passing the Education Bill is therefore the quickest route to a defined and funded sectoral support body for the controlled sector, with key representative functions such as area planning, for instance, that would have a basis in law. I would therefore suggest that if the member is serious about any future role for the controlled sectoral support body, that he dedicates his energy to the delivery of the programme for government commitment to establish ESA in 2013. Mr. Story. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, no surprise that I thought that would be the answer that the Minister would give, bring ESA into existence and all will be well. But that's in stark contrast to what the Minister said in this House on the 16th of April, some five months ago, when he said, I will give serious consideration to the representation of the control sector body in area planning. And currently, the control sector body is not represented fairly, while the maintained sector through NICE, which has no, which has no legislative position is at those meetings. Will he rectify the situation by ensuring that the maintained sector only has one representative at those meetings? 
Um, it should hardly surprise a member that a minister is keen to deliver on a programme for government commitment e, uh, the ECBOP. That should hardly surprise the member. Five months ago, I was of, of the firm view that the ESA bill was progressing, as agreed under the Heads of Agreement of November 2011. Now, I am not convinced that the ESA bill is progressing, as agreed under the Heads of Agreement 2011. And I am deeply concerned that a programme for government commitment will be missed in regards to the ESA bill, and it will not be established in 2013. That should be a matter of concern to the entire House, including the member. So, there is no point in us having agreements, and we have had several agreements over ESA. I have to say, I have been involved in negotiations around ESA now for five years. I have several agreements in place with the member's party opposite. We have a programme for government commitment to establish ESA. If the member is serious about the control sector support body, and I welcome his belated interest in the control sector, I have to say, because the five years negotiations were not tied up with the needs of the control sector. They were tied up with the needs of another sector. So it's, it's belated interest in the control sector is warm, heartwarming, but if he's serious about getting it established, then you need to get serious about ESA. Uh, can the Minister reiterate how the Area Plan and Steering Group will work to protect the, the future of rural schools? Contrary to some representations, there is no policy to close rural schools. There is a policy to improve educational outcomes for all our young people and those within rural communities, I am on record as stating, have the same rights of access to good education as their counterparts living in urban communities. I have emphasised uh, to the Area Planning Steering Group, and indeed I will be the final decision maker in regards to these matters, that rural communities need to have access uh, to schools, and, and rural communities need to have access to schools in rural communities. So therefore, there is a clear commitment from me both in terms of policy direction and in terms of reference, that the steering group's task is to support rural communities in the delivery of education. Pat Ramsey. Mr. Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his response to date. Would the Minister acknowledge the importance that further education plays in the career and employment opportunities of our young people? And has he had any discussions with the Employment and Learning Minister to ensure that there are representatives on these area steering groups? Uh, I acknowledge both, and yes, I have had discussions with the uh, Dale Minister, and I'm pleased to report that a Dale official will be sitting uh, in the steering group as an observer status uh, from its next meeting. Uh, Mrs. Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister give an assurance to the House that the voluntary, integrated, and controlled schools will all have an equal position on a par with CCMS in the current deliberations on area planning? They will have their status as outlined in legislation. Um, there is a legislative commitment for us to promote and facilitate integrated uh, education and Irish medium education. Uh, CCMS is established through legislation, etc. So, of course, they will have their voice recognised as the legislative uh, format sets out. Paul Gervin. Question number two. <coughs> Uh, Bruce, Brusley Centre in Ballyclare, uh, within the North Eastern Education Library Board, board, is the only vacant school property in the South Antrim constituency. Within the control sector, decisions on the use of vacant buildings, including declaring them surplus, will rest with the relevant Education Library Board in conjunction with Land and Property Services advice. LPS guidance requires all owners of public sector property to keep their land holdings under continual review and to release sur surplus property with the least possible delay subject to the need to realise the best value for the public purse. Voluntary grammar maintained and grant maintained in integrated schools are not owned by the Department. Decisions on the use or sale of vacant properties in these sectors are the responsibility of each school's trustees. Paul Gerber. thank the Minister for his, his answer. And I just would like to know there was a, a school which was Ballyduff Primary School uh, which was sold off. Was the use, was the land and the sale, did that go back in to be used within education, the proceeds received? Uh, I'm not aware of the individual school, but if it fell under the control of the North Eastern Education Library Board, uh, then it has to fall under the Land and Property Services advice and gains in, in regards to those matters. So any finances would have to be returned to the appropriate source as outlined in that guidance and advice. 
Danny Cunningham. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer. And um, in line with his comment about getting value for the public purse, not just in South Antrim but throughout Northern Ireland, are there many uh, library board or areas that are leased between either the board and the departments or other parts of government where we're not necessarily getting value for money? Well, I, I don't have that information in front of me. Um, th there's clear guidance from both my department and from the Department of Finance and Personnel and indeed a principle of government that any agency acting on behalf of government should be getting best value for money. If the member has incidents where he has concerns about or particular cases he has concerns about, I'd be happy to talk to him further if he wants to bring them to my attention. Uh, Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Question three. Indicative budgets for each grant aided school were prepared as part of the consultation process. These budgets are for illustrative purposes only and reflect the delegated budget that individual schools would have received in this current financial year if the proposed changes have been implemented. My proposals on the reform of the Common Funding Scheme are still out for consultation. I have not taken any final decision on these proposals yet. It is not possible, therefore, to provide figures on the budgets that will be made available to schools for next year until these decisions are made. In addition, other factors such as the increase in the aggregated schools budget, ASB for next year, overall enrolment levels, the number of free school meal entitled pupils, and the number of newcomer and traveller pupils, etc., will impact on funding levels at individual school level. The independent review led by Sir Bob Salisbury recommended that more funding should be targeted at pupils from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, and that this funding should be weighted towards schools with significant concentrations of disadvantage. It should be remembered that investment in schools is on the way up rather than on the way down. The aggregated schools budget is set to increase by £15.8 million next year, and I have already announced my intention to inject an additional £30 million into it over the next two years targeted at social deprivation. I have not made any final decisions on changes to the scheme. I am open to hearing alternative ideas. The consultation closes on the 18th of October. I would encourage everyone with an interest in education to take part in this debate and to submit their views to my department by that date. Mike Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister. I, I have uh, debated with some local heads in the Strangford area, and it is their clear, clear view, Mr. Speaker, that uh, if the Minister goes ahead, that these uh, proposals will hit the most vulnerable, special education needs will suffer, wraparound services will suffer, uh, and in fact, that the outcome will be uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Does the Minister agree? There is no proposals contained within the consultations to cut special educational needs services, so I'm not sure how the principals have come to that conclusion. Special educational needs services have been ring-fenced, uh, both through my time and through my predecessor's time, so I'm not sure how that conclusion has come to be. But, but the member would surely agree with me, and we had a discussion during the previous uh, questions about the effects of poor educational attainment on, a, on the chances of the person, of the child. And in our prisons, our prisons are full of young people from socially deprived backgrounds who did not have the chance of a good education or who failed or were failed by education in the earlier part of their lives. We also know that young people with poor educational backgrounds and from socially disadvantaged backgrounds are more likely to suffer poor health. They're more likely to be unemployed. So does the member, if he's serious and his party is serious about investing in early years, and investing in the early part of a, of a person's life, then my proposals, and I'm not saying uh, by line by line of my proposals, if there's alternatives out there, then I listen to the alternatives. But my proposal is this, that we put more funding into those schools that have more children from socially deprived backgrounds. I think that's a good thing. And when we, I was in Toronto and when I was in New York, they are doing the exact same thing, because they too have recognised that if a child comes from a socially disadvantaged background, they have less chance to succeed in education. Surely we as an assembly, and indeed the programme for government, commits us, commits us to tackling social disadvantage. I believe my proposals are, are, are in the right direction of tackling social disadvantage, but I put the challenge up to the member and the member's party. If you have an alternative, if you have an alternative proposal, please forward it during the consultation process. Gregory Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister alluded twice just now to uh, reference to alternatives, and if there were alternatives, to put them forward. 
You will be aware that the Chairman of the Education Committee and the Committee itself, I think, have looked at and asked him to examine another way of examining and uh, assessing uh, those areas that are particularly acute in terms of uh, underachievement. Uh, will he ensure that he examines those very, very closely in order to come to a more rounded opinion? Um, I'm not sure which document or proposal the member is referring to exactly. I know the committee is proposing to investigate further if there's other elements that should mark out disadvantage rather than free school meals, and we welcome that. I think they're going to look at international examples, and I think that's a good piece of work. And uh, it will certainly and always will take under consideration any reports and documentation coming from the Education Committee. So I, I can assure the member if the committee has alternative proposals or formatting alternative proposals, they will carry the, the deserved weight which uh, uh, such a report uh, deserves. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. In, in terms of the, the common formula funding, Minister, and I've heard what you say, you haven't made any decision yet, but there's a lot of fear out there in hundreds and hundreds of schools that they will lose money. You know, we're talking about schools with under 105 losing an average of 24,500. What can you say today to give some reassurance to those schools, other than you haven't made up your mind yet? Well, it's a consultation process, and what I'm saying to those schools is respond to the consultation process. And if there's an alternative, and particularly from the members' party, uh, there's political responsibility goes with being uh, in the Assembly as well. So if the members' party has an alternative to my proposals, then I would welcome them. Um, the consultation is out there. We are targeting social disadvantage. That's the key principle. That's the one I'm not going to deviate from. But if there's an alternative way of funding that targeting social disadvantage, then I can assure the member and I can assure the schools he refers to that I'm open to listening to that. And I also emphasise, and I emphasise quite strongly, the budgets that schools are currently working off do not include the £15.8 million extra that is going into aggregated schools' budgets next year. They are working on this year's figures. Our school budget goes up dramatically next year, and as a result of that, all schools will see a percentage rise uh, in their um, f figures, depending on final decisions made, depending on the number of pupils they have, and on the other elements which I read out in response to Mr. Nesbitt's, Mr. Nesbitt's question. Robin Newton. Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number four. Development proposal number 237 for the amalgamation of Nakbreda High School and Newtonbreda High School was published by the South Eastern Education Library Board on the 16th of April 2013. The statutory two-month consultation period ended on the 16th of June. However, on the 25th of June, the Belfast Education and Library Board advised my department that it had not carried out the required consultations with the schools in its area, which may be affected by the three SEELB development proposals, namely Nackbreda, Newton Breda High Schools, Dundonald High School and Priory Integrated College, Hollywood. The, co the consultation was initiated by the BELB in the week commencing the 9th of September and ended on the 30th of September. A response from the BELB is expected in the next few weeks. I will then make my decision on the proposal as soon as possible in order to provide clarity and certainty for the schools affected by the proposal. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Minister acknowledge that uh, the outcomes of uh, and the history of school mergers has at the best been mixed? At the best been mixed? And indeed, that amongst the parents and the teaching staff of both schools, there are still major concerns. And what would the minister intend to do to assuage those concerns? Um, I'm aware of uh, the concerns raised during the consultation period, both by elected representatives of the area, uh, a number of the schools involved, and indeed parents' representative groups, which I also met. I can assure the parents that any final decision I come to, and I accept there has been an unacceptable delay in coming to this decision, but we cannot reach the decision until that statutory piece of work was carried out by the board. Uh, and uncertainty always causes further concern on, um, among people affected by any decision. But I can assure parents that any decision I come to will be based on educational evidence on the best way forward and on ensuring that there is a long-term decision made in relation to what are the, the schools in that area, and that per parents and pupils and teachers can have certainly going into the future of the makeup and shape of the schools' estate for the future. Michael Copeland. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, can the Minister, or does the Minister rather, consider that we at this stage has, have a sufficiently clear direction regarding the future of shared education to wisely proceed with the current area planning process? Um, I, I think shared education is going to evolve over years. Uh, I think the shared education report gives us a sense of direction as to where that is going. But I do believe that area planning can continue uh, in the absence of a definitive and clear uh, direction of travel in relation to shared education. And I advise the member that I intend to make a statement in relation to shared, the shared education report in the very, very near future uh, to this Assembly. But I don't believe that shared education will affect in any way uh, the, these proposals that are before us, um, given the nature of our society. Uh, and the physical divisions within our society, I believe that uh, we we're, were confident that we can make decisions moving forward. But, however, as I said, shared education is evolving and will evolve over a number of years, and no one can predict uh, the speed of that evolution the way I hope it's, it's, it's fast and it's determined going forward. So there may be opportunities in the future even for this area and other areas. I'm not just picking on this area and other areas uh, for a greater shared education element. I wonder, could the Minister provide an overall summary of the current position regarding the area planning process? Uh, area planning is progressing, um, in my opinion, has progressed further than many would have expected. We now have a completed consultation and draft area plans for our post-primary school. The primary school consultation has concluded and the boards are going through their consultation responses before providing my department with the latest draft of that. Our investment plans are based on area planning and the intelligence that has come out of area planning. And one of the, the positive, for me, one of the positive things coming out of area planning is this. Communities have started to take ownership of their schools. Now, I would like to have seen it happen earlier in some cases, but it is refreshing at times when I listen to communities who have been excluded from their schools over many, many years, now taking ownership of them and demanding the right to high-quality education for their young people. And I think that is the way forward for education. Anna Lowe. Speaker, would the Minister consider merging those schools into uh, in the integrated school, um, given the big demand for integrated education? It is not up to me as Minister to make a proposal for integrated education or any other form of education for that matter. It is up to either the school or the managing authorities to come forward with a proposal in relation to integrated education or any other form of uh, education. But one of the proposals which has been referred to is the expansion of Priory in Hollywood, and I will be in a position to make a decision on that uh, when I have the other matters have been concluded. Judith Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number five, please. Employability, including entrepreneurship, is a key theme underpinning the revised curriculum, which aims to better prepare all our young people for all aspects of life and work and enable them to develop as confident and articulate individuals, able to play their full part in society and economy. At primary school level, the area of personal development and mutual understanding, pupils are given opportunities to develop the knowledge, skills, understanding, attitudes and personal qualities related to enterprise and entrepreneurship. A post -pro Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, at post-primary level, entrepreneurship is covered under the employability strand of learning for life and work with a focus on work in the local and global economy, career management, enterprise and entrepreneurship. Pupils are given the opportunity to reflect on their own skills and areas of self-development to explore the changing concept of career and various types of jobs, including in the local area, to explore enterprise, entrepreneurship and to develop practices. Some and develop and practice some of the skills and attributes associated with being entrepreneurial. Judith Cutler. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer. And it's good to hear some of the work that is going on. In primary schools, most children have one teacher um, for the year, and this means a constant um, relationship with pupils and in the ideal time to introduce new concepts to open minds. Would the Minister agree that more could be done at primary school level um, to learn entrepreneurial skills? And has he considered um, something like the Junior Entrepreneur Programme, which is currently being run down south? Um, we, we do have a programme of work going on in our primary schools to, to in, encourage even our youngest uh, of children uh, to think outside the classroom and think about work skills and where they, where they may go. So in primary schools, we have resources including anything is possible. 
enterprise story stack for key stage one, uh, crisis waste, employability story stack for key stage one and two, and out of this board enterprise resources for key stage two. I'm always open to new ideas. Of course, often new ideas require resourcing, and our resources are quite limited at this time. But I will explore further uh, the scheme which is currently operating down south. Sam the Minister tell us how many previous STEM initiatives have fallen by the way, what has been put in their place, or what does he plan to put in their place? Well, off the top of my head, I can't recall any previous STEM initiatives that may have fallen uh, by the wayside. STEM is now a central core of our education. It is heavily promoted both by the Department of Education and Dell, and rightly so, uh, in moving forward, both for our individual learners and our economy. And I think we uh, promote it quite well. Um, that we have programmes in place, both between business and education, business and, and the Dale Minister as well. So STEM is out there, out being, are being promoted. I think, and I've said this previously in the House, however, when it comes to careers advice, in my opinion, the most influential career advisor continues to be your parents. And parents have to realise that our economy has moved on, and indeed the world economy has moved on, and STEM subjects are central to any young person's uh, career development going into the future. And if we want to compete on a worldwide basis, or if an individual wants to compete on a worldwide basis, they need to have a firm uh, understanding of the STEM subjects. Fergal McKinney. Mr. McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Minister. And uh, would you agree that one, one of those good ideas might be ensuring our universities take a lead role in supporting entrepreneurial education in schools and, college and colleges and can he tell us as he had discussions with the Minister of Employment and Learning in this regard? Well, it is not up to me to, to dictate what our universities do, though there is a good working relationship both between my department and the Minister of Dale's department and I and the Minister of Dale as well in regards to cost-cutting themes. Uh, and I used an example earlier where we have brought a Dale representative onto the area planning um, body as well. So we are both sides know exactly in terms of future infrastructure. But in terms of university courses, etc., the member will also be aware that in my recent announcement in relation to A levels and GCSEs, the bodies represented on that uh, um, expert body was universities. We want to hear their views. I have had discussions with our universities and will continue to have discussions with our universities about education and employment uh, in its totality moving forward. I have also had recent discussions with uh, key employers in our economy, talking to them about what skills they require, what their experience has been of our young people who have left school, what further skills they have to apply and, and in terms of numeracy and literacy, etc. And I find those conversations very enlightening uh, about the outcomes of our education system and how that interfaces with, with employment. So there are continuing discussions ongoing across a wide range of uh, stakeholders within our education system and outside our education system, and they in, are helping me formulate policy moving forward. Uh, Tom Elliott. Mr. Thank you. Uh, Number six. It is anticipated that the annual budget for the Education and Skills Authority, ESA, will largely be the sum of the budgets of the existing eight arm's length bodies that will transfer to ESA, i.e., the five education library boards, the Council for Celtic Maintained Schools the Staff Commission and the Youth Council. The current budget in 2013-14 for these eight bodies is uh, $1,511,000,000 resource and $70 million capital. In addition, the Department carry, currently carries out the role of funding authority for voluntary grammar and grant maintained integrated schools. This function and some other operational duties carried out by uh, the Department, such as capital funding for the voluntary maintained schools, will also transfer to ESA with the associated resources. Work is currently ongoing to establish the level of funding for ESA, but at this stage, a high-level estimate of the annual budget would be somewhere in the region of 1.8 billion resource, not 0.2 billion capital, based on the budget currently available for the education in 2014-15. Tom Elliott. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that uh, detailed information. I'm, I'm just surprised that um, there will not be more efficiency uh, if it goes into one body of, of ESA as opposed to the, the number of bodies that there currently uh, are. But uh, given that there the, um, has been an indication from the Northern Ireland Audit Office that his department has the worst efficiency budgeting, uh, could he explain how he would try to improve that 
uh, from moving from all the, the number of bodies into the one ESA? Well, I'm not sure which report the member is reading or how he's having a liberal interpretation of the audit office's report, which I suspect that may be the case. Uh, I I'm stand here and say that my department is one of those very few departments that does not return money to the centre because we spend it, and we spend it on education where it is required. Uh, and that, that is a quite a remarkable feat, given the, the, the budget lines that we have, because we have a very complicated management scheme in terms of the boards uh, and the bodies which I've read out, and we have somewhere in the region of 1,100 schools which also operate budgets as well. So all those matters, I, I think, point to the fact that the Department of Education is doing quite well in spending its budget. The estimated savings of ESA over a 10-year period is £185 million. Pounds. Those savings would be taking place now if the Member's Party had not been instrumental in blocking ESA. It is the Member's Party that has been pulling the strings of other parties in the Chamber to ensure that ESA has not moved forward. So every day and every week and every month and every year that ESA is delayed because of political game playing between the parties opposite, the public purse is losing out on millions upon millions of pounds which could be used for frontline education, whether it be in Fermanagh, Oma, Belfast, Lurgan, wherever it may be. So perhaps the Members' Party may consider in their deliberations when they are playing games with ESA and other projects how much money they are withholding from frontline education systems because they want to play politics over this issue. Could I ask the Minister to outline where the savings likely will be with the establishment of ESA? The savings would be largely in terms of administration, a more centralised administration system, a reduction in senior management posts, and a more efficient operating system coming from amalgamating eight bodies into one. Though there is going to be a central, central, centralisation of bodies. It is my vision, and indeed set out by my predecessor and myself, that ESA would be frontline in the sense that it would be operating in our local towns, that there would be accessibility both to rural and urban communities, and that ESA would not be centralised in some way in one of our cities or major towns. It would continue to be a local education service delivering for the needs of local people. But we have to get there. We have spent years messing about on this issue. We are losing money which could be provided to frontline education services. It could be provided uh, to allow me to continue with my common funding scheme to target socially deprived areas, not at the expense of other schools. So all these we're losing out as every day, week and month passes on ESA. And it is long past time for this Assembly and this Executive to realise that. Concludes question time and questions to the Minister.